Welcome to the Biohacking Superhuman Performance Podcast. My name is Natalie Nidham. I'm a nutritionist, a human potential, and epigenetic coach, and I created this podcast to bring you the latest ways to take control of your health and longevity. We cover it all, from new technology to ancestral health practices, personalized interventions, and a very special interest of mine, peptides. Enjoy the show. Welcome back to the podcast. I'm so happy today to be welcoming Dr. Suzanne Faree Turner. Dr. Turner is the founder and medical director at Bind Medical Associates, which is a clinic that's located, um, I think, just outside of Atlanta, Georgia. Dr. Turner is double board certified in family medicine, and she practices functional family medicine with special interest in geriatrics, in bioidentical hormone therapy, functional medicine, diabetes, and heart disease prevention. She's also a fellow of the Dr. Seed's SSRP Mastermind, as well as a fellow of the American Academy of Anti-Aging and Regenerative Medicine. And if that wasn't enough, Dr. Turner is also on the faculty at Emory University. So clearly, Dr. Turner is super qualified, but more importantly, she's amazing. She's so incredibly knowledgeable. She's a master with peptides. And today we're focusing our conversation specifically on cognitive performance in the boardroom. And this is because Dr. Turner sees this a lot in her practice where she has a population of patients who are in their 50s, their 60s, and their 70s. These are people that are working at a very high level much later in life, and they need to keep all the lights on, all the wheels turning, everything working in tip-top shape. So hopefully you will find that this interview is really enlightening. I mean, Dr. Turner, you're going to start to see a very common theme coming up with all these doctors that I will interview. Everybody starts in the same place. And whether they're medical doctors or practitioners like myself or whatever it is, we all start with optimization from the bottom up. It starts with lifestyle. It starts with diet. It starts with all the basics. And once we're through the basics, we're going to get into the fancy, more sexy stuff. So the dihexas, the c lengths, the cerebral license, the C-max, um, and even a few interesting ones, things like GRP, GLP agonists, which were originally developed for cognitive performance reasons, but then when people found that they were so effective with weight loss, they switched over to using them for weight loss only and forgot about what they do for the brain. So anyway, the podcast says it all. So I'm going to get out of the way here and let us get started. But please remember that if you get value out of this podcast, please, please, please leave us a review on iTunes or Spotify or Google Podcasts, wherever you're listening to the podcast, because that always helps us to be seen and to be heard. And it helps me to get more amazing guests to interview on the podcast. So thanks so much for being here. And I hope you enjoy this interview. If you want to reach out to me, you can find me on Facebook or on MeWe in the Biohacking Superhuman Performance Groups, or you can reach out to me on my website, which is natnidham.com. Without further ado, here's Dr. Turner. Okay. Hi, welcome to the show, Dr. Suzanne Turner. It's so nice to have you today. Thank you. It's nice to be here, Natalie. Yeah. So, um, so Dr. Suzanne and I have been talking for a while. So, I'm just I'm having a glitchy time getting into this interview mode because we've just been chatting. But um, Dr. Turner was very graciously agreed to be on the podcast today, and we're going to be talking about a really fascinating topic that I am. Um, you know, I work on this kind of stuff with my clients all the time, but it's all we're talking about boardroom cognition. So basically lighting up your brain so that you rock it out in the boardroom, right? Um, but before we get into that, Dr. Turner is also a member of the of Dr. Seed's SSRP Mastermind. And so I actually got to sit in on your last mastermind uh, about a month ago, I guess it was, which was really interesting. And I mean, I literally felt like a fly on the wall because you guys were all on site and I was online kind of peering in the whole time. <laughs> but um, when did you get involved with the SSRP, Dr. Suzanne? I have a feeling that you're one of the anchor docs in that program. It has been, uh, it's been really great. They just, they just started about a year ago. We used to be part of um, International Peptide Society. And uh, before that, just going, attending a lot of the meetings about peptides. And then they created that society that SSRP has, has sort of wound off of that. 
as they they really wanted to be an organization that was about patient care and not about um, vendor support. So I think that's how they spun off on their own is, is trying to be, or we've spun off on our own as trying to be something where we're really focused on making sure the patients do well. And so for example, last weekend, we did that big um, event where we, several of us spoke on, um, we partnered with the Leukemia Lymphoma Society and, and several of us spoke about how peptides can help with cancer and why this is a beautiful fit. The majority of new peptides in creation right now are, or in research right now are in um, oncology and then uh, metabolism. So interesting to um, try to figure out how we can play together and uh, I think that's what we're trying to do. So I'm one of the fellows and there's, um, I used to speak when we did, when IPS worked with A4M, the, all the organizations, all the um, right. numbers, names, yeah. <laughs> um, I used to be a speaker for them. And then um, we flipped over to working with um, SSRP because of their really good focus on patient care. That's amazing. And you really get that sense when you're there that, you know, you've got a room full of physicians really sitting down and getting to the bottom of what is it that's giving rise to all of these conditions. And it obviously comes down to this whole cellular health, cellular function, the mitochondria, like getting into very granular and then allowing that to kind of expand up into your systems, your organs, your tissues, like just, I probably said that backwards, your tissues, your organs, your systems. <laughs> um, but really, you know, and having all these people in a room with their heads together kind of sharing information and strategies because peptides are, I mean, they've been around for a, for quite a long time, but I think, and you would know this better than me, clinically, not as long as certain other things. And so frankly, in any area of medicine, I'm sure that bringing physicians together into a room and having them brainstorm, like what worked for you, what didn't work for you, what patient does well with this, that, and the other thing has got to be the real power of you know, of just how you practice. I actually, it's really something I've never experienced before. And I think um, we, we could talk about this on another podcast, but, but medicine in general is such a competitive, you know, going to medical school, going to residency, I never felt safe to ask questions I never, I always felt like it, it was, it was very abusive. Uh, the medical, the medical education system is a very abusive. And I feel like I still have a little PTSD from that. I, I don't mean to demean people who actually have PTSD, but I, I do feel like there is a little bit of that that still hangs on to me because your peers were not peers. These were not people that you could share information um, and say, oh, the goal of sharing this information is so we can take care of this patient. Uh, what we would run into is if you don't know, you're an idiot and you need to not be here. Right. So very competitive. Yeah. 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 So, so to have a, a group that everyone comes from their own different perspective and their own different focus and interest. And so as we've come together as a team, we're sharing information and then going over the information that we learn and saying, Hey, what did you take from that? And did you hear that? Oh, wait, I didn't hear that. Oh, okay, great. How would you use that with this patient? Oh, I've got this patient. What do you think? And it's this collaborative thing that's so beautiful and creative and not like any medicine thing I've been part of before. So it's a real blessing. That's amazing and powerful. Honestly, like it's really powerful. Well, that's amazing. Well, good for you guys and good for good for all your patients, mostly, because yeah, I think they end up being the winners in the end. So, um, okay, so let's launch in today's topic. Today's topic, boardroom cognition. Dr. Turner, why don't you tell us about why you, you picked your topic? So why don't you tell us a little bit about why you picked it? I'm sure it's got to be one of your things that you work on with your patients. Right. So this is a this is near and dear to my heart because a good number of my patients are in that that 50, 60, you know, late 40s, 50s. They own businesses or they are um, executives of some sort. And they're finding that either anxiety is overwhelming them or even losing words, the inability to come up with words to remember to speak their minds, their ability to communicate because of that suffers their ability to um, concentrate or focus on things that they're doing, not because they have ADD, but because they're, as I spoke a minute ago about having too many windows open at the same time. So as a, a business owner in particular, you have so many things going on at the same time that even though you might be in a Zoom meeting with someone that you're not fully present because of that 
all the things that you have, all the balls you're juggling. And this is sort of a unique thing, I would say, to moms and to uh, boardroom people. So, Because yeah, I was going to ask you, actually, to that point, because um, are you finding it? Because I see it in my practice with people. And I mean, we can come out with it. This is the year 2020, if you're listening to this in 10 years. So <laughs> this is that year where everybody's worried about everything all the time. <laughs> Right, right. Right. But at the same time, are you fine? Because I, with women, definitely I see as their hormones start to shift, as they're moving into menopause, they lose the estrogen and that has some very serious effects on their cognition. But you're, what you're saying also is you're seeing it also in men, right? Absolutely. With both genders. And is it for different reasons then, or similar reasons? Like with men also, I find you know, if their hormones are not optimized, and this is becoming a really hot topic, right? Because I think even female hormone optimization has been, if I talk to 10 women, five of them might be in the boat and the other five are like, oh no, I just want to do things naturally. And I'm like, okay, so you just want to go fall off the cliff naturally. And that's okay. That's your choice. But just know (laughs) that there may be a better way to, to do it. But now for, and women are starting to become a bit more open to it, particularly with the bioidenticals, that kind of stuff. But with men, even in the last six months, I find the discussion is really moving towards men in their 50s and 60s are starting to open their eyes to, wow, maybe I do need to optimize my hormones and the difference that it makes for them. Well, and keep in mind, or uh, I'm sure your experience is this, that that one of the things we're seeing is these, these men, they're not able to do the things they want to do. They're trying to, these are men who are, older than usually would be still working. I mean, a lot of these men 15 right. years ago would not be still working. And so trying to make sure that these, these fellows are able to continue to do what they need to do, both, um, you know, sit, sitting in their jobs as CEO or as CFO or whatever their job is to, to be able to continue to do what they're, what they need to do. Uh, it's a diff, it's a more of a struggle as they get into that past 60, past 65, past 70, we see those changes occur. And so now I'm seeing these guys who are staying on the boards of whatever companies or corporations that they've been on, even into their late seventies and still functional. And th- they want to be able to keep that functionality. Maybe they're going to the gym on a regular basis. Maybe they're taking care of themselves really well, diet, you know, diet wise, lifestyle wise, doing, making good choices. And so we they they end up wanting to continue to be able to do the things they need to do, and we know that that with the decline in um, so many things with immunosenescence, with the immune system not functioning as optimally as it did when you were twenty, all of those things play a part, and they play more of a part every decade. Yeah, yeah, no, and and that's that's so interesting, you know, and I think that this all plays into the discussion also. And somebody that I work with said this to me, and it really stuck with me. With increased lifespan, come there comes a need for an increase in health span, yeah. and right, and and we don't. And it's funny because I think that as a society, more and more we're getting to the point where people aren't that. I mean, at least in my circle, certainly for me, I'm not looking forward to retiring. Particularly, right. I don't really want to retire. I mean, I may want to change the way that I work, but it's, I don't have this, like the, the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow for me is not retiring and hanging out. It's kind of like just getting better at what I do and contributing more, maybe doing it a little bit differently, maybe working a few less hours a week. But, you know, right. it's, I think that, it, and I think that as that becomes more common, that people, like you're saying, like, you know, you have these men and women who are sitting on boards, who are contributing in many, many ways, the bar is a little higher. and. Right that natural decline that we experience as part of the human condition becomes less okay. And so we want to find ways to hold on to that performance. Right. Exactly. And that it's, it's particularly obvious when you're the person sitting next to you is 35. My right hand nurse practitioner, (laughs) who's been with me for seven years now, you know, she's 35 years old and to keep up with her and her memory, I have to study twice as hard to keep up with her uh, memory. And honestly, there are days when I go to her office and go, Melissa, what did that person say yesterday? I cannot remember what they said. (laughs) And it's, it's because, you know, it's, it's because of being 10 years older than her. Hmm. Okay. 
you, you, well, you don't look like you're 10 years old. <laughs> you look like you're about the same age. So whatever it is that you're doing, you're doing something very well. So I'm actually 99. Are you? Oh, that's <laughs> super impressive. <laughs> I need to get that. Whatever it is you're doing, I need some of that. Um, so what can people do? So, and we were talking about this earlier, like we can start, you know, people might sit and yawn, but I think it's important to mention that before we get into the fancy stuff, it is really important for people to understand the value of the foundation that they lay before they get into the fancy stuff. So, I mean, I can talk about it till I'm blue in the face, but I'm supposed to be interviewing you. So why don't you tell us Dr. Turner? <laughs> Well, I'm going to always start out. We, my first office visit is about two hours long usually because I'm going to ask, I'm going to get into all the nitty gritty of what are your exposures? What's your diet like? Tell me about your teeth. Tell me about what's happening with your, um, with your skin. What's going on with, what are you putting on your body? What are you exposing yourself to? How's your sleep? What is your exercise regimen? Tell me not only what is your diet, but when is your diet? How does that look? And so there's so much to that. And the, the more research we do, it, it's all related to how your immune system responds, how your, uh, how your um, cells are able to respond to in their optimal way. So how do we make sure that those cells are able to respond in their optimal way? And that's laying the foundation like you just mentioned. Not only the hormones, I would actually say that's kind of the next level up, but the, the baseline would be you know, I have an 84 year old who um, runs, he, he placed first in the world in triathlon a few years ago oh and God. came to me 80 and said, Hey, I'm feeling kind of tired. What do you think I should do? And he's like swimming miles every day. And it's amazing. And I was like, I'm not sure what you should do. <laughs> <laughs> you should tell me what you do and how you got to where you are today. That's exactly, what you should do. <laughs> exactly. He's great. <laughs> such a terrific fella. Um, but to, to that point, I think all of that has to start. And the reason why he's 84 and doing triathlons is because he's eaten well and slept well and managed his lifestyle. Well, all these years, um, I think one of the things I'll start. So if I'm going to see a patient to be a little practical, I'll say, uh, um, I'll make sure that they're working on their sleep. I think that's the first thing we have to work on. And especially in this age group, I see, um, that cortisol level rising, then being getting into a, a more stressed state, so that kind of all day long they're either running with that higher than they should be cortisol, or they're exhausted and running with a lower than they should be cortisol. I love to talk about that Goldilocks space for cortisol, and so if their cortisol is going to be too high or even too low, they're not going to be able to sleep. So what are the things that they're doing that are contributing to them not sleeping? Are they making a priority of sleep? Are they giving it the the time? And the uh, respect that it's due as a recovery can almost always get my athletes to participate in that because I can tell them their recovery will be better if their sleep is better. It's a little harder with my boardroom folks because explaining recovery and how that's valuable for brain health, uh, it's a little bit more tricky. It's a little more specific. Uh, you're, you don't have necessarily that um, clear boundary, clear outline like you do or outcome like you do with um, muscle building or running, for example. Yeah, I remember having this conversation actually with my son when he was he was quite young. Like I think he was he was 16 or 17 and he's he's a really good student. But I remember as you know, when and kids and it's funny because. I think we see this reflected at both ends of the spectrum when you're older and when you're younger. And frankly, even in between, because we live in a society where we don't value sleep as a rule. Right. Um, but when he was younger, I remember I'd come across a paper that talked about how it, it actually drew lines between sleep deprivation and cognitive performance the next day. Like your memory will suffer by a defined percentage the next day with lack of sleep. So the argument or the case being, you're better off sleeping an extra hour than studying an extra hour because you will do better. Right. And, you know, helping people to understand that at the beginning of their life. And then later on, I mean, all along the spectrum, right. And getting people to understand. And I've, I've found that helping them part of that has been getting to understand what happens while you sleep. Right. Right. Because the idea that we close our eyes and we shut down and the body shuts down is not a very powerful one. But when you start to explain to people 
all the stuff that's going on, like the, the brain clearing toxins or the muscles rebuilding. And they, you know, you're like, you know, once you shut down your, your brain center, the everybody goes and gets to work kind of thing. That's what I will usually talk about is the nighttime is the time when the trash collectors come. Yes. <laughs> all the trash shoots open up in your brain and all that trash that's been built up throughout the day will come. So I, I use the example of my exam room, which is kind of small and, you know, maybe a 12 by 12 room. And I'll say, imagine if this room was full of boxes and you and I were trying to conduct this interview with this room full of boxes, we could do it and I could still take care of you, but it would be slower. There'd be a lot of what I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. And then trying to get, move them out of the way so I could get to them and touch them to do the exam. It would just be it would be more taxing for me to actually accomplish the goal of listening and taking care of the patient. And so that's what it's like in your brain cells when you're not getting adequate sleep is your rooms are are full of boxes that are unusable and now you're not getting them dumped out. So it's just more difficult for you. You need require more energy and you may surpass the cell's ability to Uh, create the amount of energy that's needed. And then you can't find anything. You can't find the file that you needed to remember about that task that you were supposed to be doing, uh, et cetera. So sleep probably is my number one, even above diet, even above um, anything else. I think sleep is my number one to get patients to, um, to focus on. So if they come to me and they're not sleeping, I will start right there. That's simple, simple. Amazing. Okay, great. Yeah. And I would definitely agree. Besides, if you're not sleeping, it's going to mess up your diet. So so we have sleep. What's next? What's what's next in Dr. Turner's hierarchy of uh, climbing to optimal? This is a tough tough call. And I would say it's a close tie between resistance training and diet changes. So I would say some degree of calorie restriction, although I never use that word with patients, or I really try not to use that phrase with patients because it seems very scary when you say that. Yeah. Um, One of the things we know about the brain is if you do, uh, if you restrict your calories for 12 hours, that your brain has already lost all of its glucose stores, all of its stored up energy. So it begins to go through ketosis. And not the kind of ketosis like we hear about diabetic type one diabetic patients going through, but ketosis like uh, where they begin to create their own ketones, which is this fascinating molecule that does so much amazing things for our brain, um, helps us to handle that stress that you had, that you built up throughout the day. Um, These, that is, happens at hour 12. So all the articles that you read that talk about having to wait until hour 8, 16 or 18, and some people are 22 hours fasting, the brain only needs 12 hours. So as I'm approaching these patients, I'm going to say overnight, all I need you to do is wait 12 hours between eating. So that's my minimum requirement of anyone who's coming on board with the program that we're doing. So sleep eight hours and fasting 12 hours is probably one and two. And I'll just say that one and two only because it's, they're easy to pair together because yeah. they're they occur at the same time. Yeah. And then I would say that diet plays into that. And it's so common, especially for our executives to be out eating, not right now, but out (laughs) eating foods, right? So many of them have come back to me this last nine, 10 months and said, oh my gosh, I've lost 12 pounds. I've lost 17 pounds because they're eating at home. They're not eating it, you know? And there's no trace there's no trays of cookies in the boardroom meetings, you know, like yeah. I, my husband would come home from work and he'd be like, oh my God, we had a four hour meeting today. I had to eat like five cookies just to stay awake. <laughs> like, no, no. <laughs> and they don't provide things that are good for you. No, no. I had a patient the other day say, I felt so bad. She brought donuts and I didn't want to, I felt guilty not eating a donut. And I went, yeah. How is that okay in the world? <laughs> yeah, because she should feel guilty for bringing you donuts. I'm just going to say. <laughs> yeah, no, I have that conversation with clients all the I had a client who was so sick and she said, well, you know, my mother-in-law, she brought me the pound cake or the coffee cake. And I'm like, you need to lovingly sit her down and say, you know, you can't do that anymore. It doesn't help me. It doesn't help me. It hurts me. And mm-hmm. uh, and hopefully they hear you. Anyway, Okay. So I think this unique piece of that that's so important in this group and probably in other groups too, but I think I see it a lot in this group is um, alcohol. And I think it goes under discussed. Yeah. Uh, It's really important. I think we have to realize how that changes the efficiency of the cell. And this not only includes 
brain cells, although that's particularly relevant. Um, it also includes heart, liver, kidney, pancreas, everything. So we're decreasing that cell's ability to fight. And what I'll often see is I'll do a blood test called an adiponectin, which will give us a really good idea of is, is that something that they're, that they're experiencing? Also, that's commonly associated. The two of those are commonly uh, related. So the, we'll see that adiponectin be low in response to this high glucose load that the body gets in the evening. Mm. If they're going to have a glass of wine or whatever, I'm going to ask them to limit it to one. Yeah. If they're going to have it, I want them to wait until after their meal so that it's the only carbohydrate they have and it is the final piece of their meal. We talk about with coronavirus flattening the curve, that's how we flatten the curve of that insulin production. And so if we can get it's in, this is your wheelhouse, so I'll step back. <laughs> this is my world, yeah, for sure. But, but I love this. That's yeah. what I recommend is that you if you're gonna, if you have to have that glass of wine, limit it to one and have it follow whatever else you're eating so that you're, you know, when, when you go out to the Mexican restaurant and you're having the chips, those should not, they should, if at worst case scenario, they should be at the end of the meal. Uh, only because we're trying to limit that super high insulin spike that the body gets. That's just a signal for things to happen and that no good thing comes from it. For sure. I love that. And you know, what's interesting is what I'm seeing an interesting trend on social media of all these, um, and I'm seeing it in the 30 something thing crowd, this kind of wave of giving, stepping away from the booze. Right. Right. And have you tried to have that conversation with like a 50, 60 or 70 year old person? They are like, it's non-negotiable. Yep. Right. And, and I'm, and I'm, in, and I mean, look, I'm a bad person to talk to about this because I could give a flying fajita about booze. I don't care. I can live without it quite happily. The problem I have is, of course, is, you know, in my house, my husband will open a bottle of wine. He'll pour me a glass, which I might drink half of. And if I'm not, you know, if, if we are not both mindful, he will finish the bottle. Right. <laughs> and, um, and it's, I find it interesting that with this younger generation, where they're starting, they seem to be starting to come to this place where, yeah, alcohol is not a, it's not a right. It's not a necessity for me to know, to think that I'm enjoying my life to have alcohol. Whereas in our, our later, in these later decades, we're seeing that it's almost non-negotiable. And so we're having to have these discussions. Okay. You know, have a glass of wine, but have it after your meal. So you blunt that insulin spike and that whole thing. So, you know, it's interesting. That's my big challenge is, will you just do it on Friday and Saturday only? Yeah. I tried that. My husband's like, well, what about Thursday? <laughs> like Thursday still during the week. <laughs> yeah. It's a challenge. I, I just say it's not on a school night. You can't have it on a school night. Right. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Um, we certainly can, but again, we know that this is going to affect the um, the cognition of, of the cells. We know it's going to affect your neurons, um, both from an apoptosis and, and um, cellular death problem, but also from a, a healthy cellular function problem. So the cells that you do have that are functioning optimally um, are going to begin to scream out, they'll have that oxidative or cellular stress, and they'll just begin to, to struggle. So we're increasing the production, you know, decreasing the mitochondrial function, increasing production of reactive oxygen, these, these uh, um, sort of bullies that run around and damage everything in our cells. And, and unfortunately that the brain is particularly susceptible to that being made primarily of fat. So it's this is where we run into a lot of trouble with the brain. So if you're coming to me with a cogn cognitive uh, decline of any sort, those are going to be my sort of one, two, three is uh, sleep, and fasting, not using that word, and yeah. then um, and then fixing out, looking for alcohol intake. Yeah, well, I, I'll call it meal timing. When we're talking about that twelve hours, I'll talk to people about meal timing, and it's less it's less scary to your point than right. fasting or caloric restriction. <laughs> They're like, ah. um, so okay. So first step to upgrading your boardroom cognition abilities is make sure you're sleeping, cut the booze out on your school nights. You also mentioned resistance training earlier, which I think is a very underrated strategy for improving your brain. People think of resistance training as keeping their heart healthy or their muscles healthy. But why don't we talk a little bit about how what role that really plays in keeping your brain really healthy? Right. And someone said to me uh, a few years ago, muscle is the currency of aging. I love that phrase. Um, it is how we 
pay forward our benefit. Muscle is the uh, most important endocrine organ we have. We think about endocrine organs like testes and ovaries and thyroid and um, the pancreas being our endocrine organs, but truly our muscle is our best endocrine organ. And it is able to do so much by processing insulin so much more efficiently, processing blood sugar efficiently. Um, It's able to take that blood sugar in such a faster way into the cell, into the exercising muscle. So your intake, I've been able to get people off of their insulin or at least decrease on their insulin by just adding resistance training. That's amazing. So, so yeah, so much benefit from, from adding that. And so you're adding just a little bit of oxidative stress. It's at, it's getting to that Goldilocks window of cellular stress. Mm-hmm. You're adding just a little bit of cellular stress upregulating your production of these master recyclers of all your antioxidants. So the question is, do I need to take all these antioxidants every day? And I really think the answer is no. In fact, my, my research has shown it actually can make things worse over time and increase your risk of things like cancer. There's some, some more recent research showing that. So what I don't, what I tell people is not to do that but instead to add something like, if you have to, adding something like a ketone ester, which will upregulate your natural recycler. So now that natural recycler is able to recycle all of your antioxidants. So they're fresh and new like daisies and able to be used all over again to help you with that um, oxidative or cellular stress. Love that. I love that. And you know what I love about that is taking action that allows the body to do what it does best, right? So taking the antioxidants in a way, it's like, you know, it's like the helicopter parent trying to do everything for their kid. Whereas instead, what you're doing is trying to give your body the tools and the ability to do what it, it can do, frankly, better than anything we can do can do it for it, right? So I love that. So that's amazing. Okay. So we're working out. We're cutting out the booze. We're water. sleeping. We didn't talk about water. Water. That's the other one. So that's another one where you see a measurable decline in cognition in the absence of appropriate hydration. So tell us about the type of water. I mean, water, yes, but do you advise your pa- your patients on certain kinds of water? Do you like to add trace minerals to the water? What's your, what's your water philosophy? Cause I find there's a few of them out there. <laughs> <laughs> I try to make everything accessible. Okay, so <laughs> let's realize where everybody is and that we live in the world and we don't always have access to water that doesn't come in a plastic water bottle. Mm-hmm. Um, so obviously I'm going to try and get people to, to drink filtered water and it would be ideal if it came out of a reverse osmosis. Yeah, I was the getting there with you. Ideally coming from something like that, where you can get a um, good quality and that you know that it's been tested. I like the Clearly Filtered is a good brand. We use that. I don't know if you're allowed to say brand, sorry, but- um, You are, it's okay. One of them that I really like. Um, and they come in pitchers and they come in like a in line for your refrigerator or your shower. Um, if you wanted to do that, I also encourage people to use, to not drink out of plastic if they can, just because Mm -hmm. of the, um, increased toxicity. Um, but the, as long as it's filtered water now, I'm also going to have people add coconut water to their water and I do it in a 10 to one ratio. I'm sorry, a one to 10. So one of coconut water to 10 of water. Right. So just for the elect- the trace minerals, electrolytes, that kind of stuff. You got it. Um, you can certainly use, there's lots of options. You could use Alka-Seltzer Gold, which would give you a few minerals. You could use, there's lots of other options that are out there. None tablets are available. I don't know, you know if that's familiar. Yeah. Um, what do you use? Um, so I'll use the Nun tablets when I'm biking. I like I like them because they're not too sweet. I find a lot of that stuff is, is a little sweet. Um, but I'll use... Um, I have a couple of supplement manufacturers that make these trace mineral drops. Ooh. And so quite often it'll be desalinated uh, water. Okay. Um, and you just put a few drops and there's one in particular where you put a couple dropperfuls in a little bit of water. And at the beginning, when you start taking them, it tastes really, it really, even though it's desalinated, it tastes quite harsh and salty. And, but the more you use it, the sweeter it gets. Huh. And according to them, as you replenish your trace minerals, you, that, that harsh taste disappears because your body basically is taking it. Um, it becomes into a better state of balance. 
That's great. So, yeah. And, and the other thing I, I thought, I find the other nice way to get people to get water that's clean and that has some of those trace minerals in it is, um, it's just drinking like an, I mean, it's not great for the environment, unfortunately, but something like a San Pellegrino, right. like some of the natural carbonated spring waters are really nice. I'm not a big fan of Perrier personally, but I like the San Pellegrino. And then there's a, I was going to say Gewurztraminer, but that's a wine. <laughs> There's another, there's a, right, there's another, something like that. it starts with a G. It's got lots of consonants and a few vowels, <laughs> <laughs> but that's another really good brand of, of spring water. So, I mean, to your point, you you do you the best you can to make it easy for people in a pinch, a squeeze of lemon juice and a sprinkle of like sea salt or something might also help. Right. Right. With that's great. With overall hydration. And I, we, we get a bioimpedance analysis on everyone. So I know what their lean body mass, approximately their lean body mass is. And so I tell them to drink um, their lean body mass divided by two is their minimum number of, of ounces of water per day. Yeah. It's plain water, you know, with minerals or not. Um, and then I'll add 16 ounces for every hour of exercise. Nice. Nice. That sounds great. Okay. So we're now hydrated. We've now had a good night's sleep. We've done our workout. Are we ready to get into the fancy stuff yet? Yes. <laughs> so of course I would say um, hormone optimization, and I can't speak enough about how that will contribute to sleep and your ability to do all the things that you're doing. And when I say optimization, I'm not talking about getting you back to when you were 25 per se. Yeah. I'm talking about maybe backing up the clock about 10 years, uh, trying to get you to where you were 40 or 30, if you are 40, trying to get you just a little bit of improvement where we're optimizing you back as close as we can, not having periods every month, like when you're 20, but I mean, getting you to where you are, um, uh, sleeping well and feeling well and, uh, where, where hormones are balanced. Of course, we're looking at your detox pathways to make sure you're handling what we're giving you. Well, that's a talk for another day, but I think that with a good practitioner, uh, that's what I would recommend that, that that would be the next step is getting your hormones balanced. Um, and if we wanted to go on and talk about what do we do if once we get all that done and now we're still having some cognitive uh, problems, then we can, I would probably, there's lots of things we can start with. It depends on the age of the person. Okay. Uh, I'm, and it depends on their, on their comorbidities. So my practice has a lot of autoimmune disease, a lot of Lyme and mold and that sort of thing. And so I will almost always start with something that's going to boost their immune response as opposed to directly attacking their cellular health. Although we're doing that because we're doing ketones, we're doing the, the meal timing, all of that. What I think is most important is that we begin to make sure that their cells are working. We know that your thymus gland is replaced by fat beginning about the age of 35. And the thymus gland is where our T cells come from that fight off infection. They're so involved in the production of so many different disease states, particularly in the brain and optimizing the way your immune cell system functions for the brain is critical. So I'm gonna start those patients on a very low, easy dose, probably something like thymosin alpha one, where they're getting, uh, unless they're coming to me reporting something like an autoimmune disease directly, I'm gonna just put them on a baseline, uh, um, something like thymosin alpha one, where they take it every few days, uh, and patients do really well. They don't really have any side effects. There they're, haven't been shown to be any side effects in research, uh, and it has so many good recent studies that have come out um, both in, uh, in hepatitis virus, as well as in this coronavirus, there were two big studies that came out of China using it. So there's good reasons to be on it for prevention and for treatment, but also for, uh, prevention and treatment of, uh, of cognitive decline of, of many sorts. So I would start a patient that did not have obvious cognitive decline. I would start them on a every three days therapy, someone who had some clear cognitive deficiencies, I would start them on probably a daily therapy, trying to get their immune system to calm down so it's not contributing to the problem. Um, after that, when we felt like that was working typically four to six weeks, something like that, and there are markers and regular blood tests we can do to see that we're getting that improvement, mm -hmm. then I'm going to begin to specifically work on improving their um, neuro nerve growth um, so we'll do a combination of things. And I, I really think that God gave us 40 days for a reason. And so I'd like to do things in six week blocks and it helps me to remember because I do 
something for six weeks, and then I make a habit of it and I do it again six weeks later, something else six weeks later. Um, I don't want the body to get too used to anything. So even when I recommend, as we were talking before, diet recommendations, I really try not to recommend anything longer than about six weeks. Um, I think we do microbiome damage if we're not, if we're doing something for too long. And I think our bodies get used to it and figure out how to work around it. And so I really like to see that six week block. So I'll probably flip flop the thymus and alpha one, thymus and beta, unless I have a specific reason to leave them on the thymus and beta as well, or to leave them on the thymus and alpha, like a um, asthma or something like that. Right. Um, And so then I'll add on top of that, one of the growth hormone secretagogues. Uh, There's lots of them available. Your provider can help you figure out which one is the best one for you. Uh, But we'll um, add one of those on top. And again, I'll rotate those about every six weeks, trying to give the body a break and then give it a little bit more push and then give it a little bit of a break, uh, trying to continue to keep the body guessing. What are we doing? What are we doing? Trying not to give it the same signal all the time. Um, There are several really, I would say in my, particularly my stressed out, my high uh, sympathetic drive clients, I'm going to start them on something. Uh, there's a peptide called dihexa. That's a great one because it's available orally. Yeah. And, um, one of my mistakes I've made is not giving patients a high enough dose. Interesting. Hard. Yeah. It's hard because it's expensive, Mm -hmm. but I think it's worth it. If you get up to the right dose, it's not worth it. If you take a low dose and it doesn't work. That's so so interesting because there's so much, so many of these peptides that we people take them with such high hopes and they come back and they're like, it didn't yeah. work. <laughs> it didn't do anything. And, and very often, you know, people are either taking it for the wrong reasons or they're not doing the right things. But I actually think it was you that brought this up at the last mastermind where you talked about when you give your patients dihexa, you also challenge them to challenge their brains, to learn yeah. something new while they're taking it, which I thought was such an interesting Like, you know, it's kind of like taking something to grow your muscles and not exercising so that the body doesn't get this, you know, the body doesn't build things it doesn't think it needs kind of thing. It's part of our body's wisdom. Um, So with the dihexa, you were actually talking about that. So maybe you want to talk about that a little bit because it's not just about a better memory. It's about building more networks in your brain so that you're more powerful. And as you're learning new pathways, your brain will build new cells in that direction. So it would be wonderful to use if you're going to couples therapy. It would be wonderful to use if you're doing your own therapy. Um, It would be wonderful to use anytime you're learning a new skill. So I try to make people commit to learning something new. And I want them to tell me what it is that they're going to learn so that they, you know, ballroom dancing. Ideally, it's something that requires the brain and the body so that you're not only working motor neurons, you're also working brain cognitive uh, neurons uh, so that you're stimulating that to grow and divide and and branch out and you're getting that dendritic branching all over the place. So, So ballroom dancing, Think is a great option for that. And if That's you can convince people to do something like that. Um, I also think powerlifting is a great option. And there are several power lifters in my gym who are over 60 and they do great. They're, they're very strong and would never have guessed that they would be able to do that. And they are. So it's, it's really nice to see um, 60s and 70s, people are able to continue to do that kind of training. Well, I think that, yeah, so sorry to interrupt, but to your point on that one, so often as people age, they give up on the, on the physical. I actually was just telling my husband today that I was driving down the street yesterday and um, the wind blew the hat off an elderly gentleman who was walking his dog. I was stopped at a red light. I literally almost got out of my car. And because I sat there and watched this poor guy desperately trying to pick the hat up off the ground. And he couldn't reach the ground. And I thought to myself, man, like if I could get out and just talk to him and say, dude, you've got to go to the, like, we forget that if we don't use it, like we're just going to lose it. And there's no reason to lose it. Like if you look in other societies where people stay active in their sixties and seventies and eighties and beyond. And to your point, like your, your triathlete who's 84 years old, like, It, the human body is capable. I mean, it may not be able to keep up with a 20 year old, but you can, you can hang on to that infrastructure and that function and it will feed your brain in addition to your body 
if you keep right. doing, if you keep moving and-, and the only, the only thing that we run against is a uh, recovery time. So sure. I will tell my elderly, um, elderly, my aged patients, I'll tell them, you have to realize that you can do the same thing that a 20 year old can do. It's just going to take you longer to get there. And if you get injured, it'll take you longer to recover, but you can do it. Yeah. This is, this is doable for sure. Yeah. And I mean, recovery is an important thing, frankly, even for the younger athlete, right? Like, I mean, it's, it's a thing that people don't want to do. They, they dismiss it they're like, and then they just wait till they break. So anyway, so dihexa, <laughs> dihexa weight with weightlifting or learning an instrument or learning a language. But if you're going to learn a language, then do it while you're doing something physical <laughs> at your standing desk, do it at your standing desk. Right. <laughs> You could jump up and down on one leg and the other. Learn how to juggle while you learn to speak Italian or something. Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. So dihexa. So the GHRH is the dihexa. What else? Do you use? Um, do you ever use any of the Solanx or C Maxes for for helping? And I mean, you know, there's the people who are seeing the decline, but we're also talking about people who aren't particularly seeing decline, but they just want that extra edge, right? So where do we draw the line between? Give, helping giving people peptides to get the edge or maybe thinking that's not the right approach? So a lot of it is patient driven. And if they're coming to me saying, yeah, I see a difference, but it's not quite where I, where I want it to be. I'm, I'm still having trouble with word finding. I'm still not quite where I want to be. That's what I'm going to add. But most of the time, as I mentioned before, I'm going to flip them every six weeks. So c link will be definitely in my armamentarium and it'll be one of the rotations. So right. they'll do dihexa for a month for six weeks, and then they'll do c link for six weeks. I'm a big fan. That's a, this is available through your regular pharmaceutical pharmacy. Um, is any of the GLP one agonists? I think they work great for the brain. They really help to improve, and that's actually where they're originally designed to be used. Is in the um, neurodegenerative disease patients. Unfortunately, patients lost too much weight. So the scientists said, woohoo, here's some money we can find. And so they rerouted it to the diabetes and weight loss route. Um, but it was originally studied in neurodegenerative disease cases. So that's where it has a good benefit. And if you can get the right patient who's not going to lose too much weight, that's a good option to use in that six-week cycle. So what are some of the GLP-1 agonists you would use for this? Uh, brand names would be like uh, um, Victoza, Trulicity, um, Ozempic. Oh, Ozempic. Yeah. I've heard about that. I heard it on the radio. Yeah, I know. I actually, it's this uh, nurse practitioner that I work with. He uses it as part of a protocol. So, um, interesting. And, but these are, but these are things that you need to get a prescription for, and you need to be working with a doctor on, uh, exactly. to, to your point, to monitor the physiological effects as, a, as an, in addition to the cognitive effects. Exactly. And okay. And what about something like cerebral lysin? Do you, is that kind of a heavy hitter you save for more neurological, like more issues, or do you use that for an optimization pro protocol as well? It used to be something I would just use for, for the very sick patients. But what I've seen more recently is moving it into not only a, a more mild case of cognitive decline, but also for pain. It's been really interesting to use for pain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, to use in joints and in, uh, so some pretty severe osteoarthritis in a patient with bad heart disease who can't do really anything else, I can give them cerebral lysin in, in the joints and they do great. But cognitively, uh, we, I can give uh, cerebral lysin and I, I usually like to give it IV. Okay. And I'll do it once a week for four weeks mm -hmm. or six weeks if I can get them to do it for six. And that'll be one of my rotations. It would be a, a once a week for six, for six weeks. I have them come to the office. We do an um, IV that they, that carries on for um, probably takes them an hour in the office to do their IV. If you can get them to do, especially the ones that are more cognitively declined, if you can get them to do the combination of dihexa uh, um, and the cerebral lysin for the first round, they really get a lot of bang for their buck with that combination. And then you can do go back to doing something like C-Lang for a month and TB4 for a month and 
uh, or six weeks and and get them those shorter those long those various courses so they're confused they're getting some confusion to their receptors right um so that may be where I start is doing dihexa plus a cerebralisin IV for someone who's coming to me saying I'm noticing some decline or I'm noticing a problem um the letters I get back the emails I get back from my patients saying oh my gosh I'm seeing all these great things that are so much better. It's that's what makes me continue to push. And and so uh, instead of just saving that for my really sick patients, I've started to give that to my executives. And that's where this is rolled into is saying, Hey, I wonder if you could get a little bit better cognitive. So the interesting thing with the cerebral license is I had a patient come back to me and say, you know, I used to wake up in the middle of the night when I was in my thirties and forties and uh, running, running businesses. I would wake up in the middle of the night and have all these ideas. I'd be so creative in the middle of the night. It would just come to me and I'd rush out and write it all down. He said, that hasn't happened in 10 years. He said, it started happening again. Come on. No kidding. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, that's what I practice medicine for. I'm so excited. (laughs) This is so great. I know that's what we do it for. Yeah. And so this, this is the reason why we do. Oh, look at me getting teared up. Um, this is the reason why we do. <laughs> I said, look at me getting teared up. This well, is the reason it is, right? Yeah. yeah. And I mean, it's, and that's, and that's an interesting point you bring up. You know, it's, it's, of course, helping people who are really ill get well is, is incredibly rewarding. But being able to make inroads for people who are essentially well and raise, help them to, be better and raise the bar and, and take them to a place that they thought was no longer accessible to them. Right. It's like, how powerful is that? Like people saying to you, I never thought I was going to be able to do this again or experience this again. It's a beautiful thing. Just think about yourself with an injury. Like my, I have had this uh, lateral epicondylitis. I, I don't stop lifting or exercising. So I've always have injuries but I've had this pain in my elbow for for probably a year almost, and it's finally gone. And I can't tell you the excitement I have every time I pick up a weight and I go, it doesn't hurt. It doesn't hurt. This is so great. So you can imagine you sort of get yourself used to like, okay, I won't be able to do that anymore. It's okay. I'm all right with it. And as we age, we tend to accumulate all those things that we're okay with not being able to do anymore. And that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. So so knowing that there are other things out there that are effective, I think is, is hopefully encouraging. Absolutely. And, you know, I think that, um, and we're seeing this happen as well is that people are no longer willing to accept, Oh, you're getting older. That's just the way it is. Like I remember when I was in my, what was it? Maybe late thirties, early forties, going to my doctor and saying, you know, my PMS is like brutal. It never used to be like this. She's like, oh, well, you know, perimenopause oh. sucks to be you. Mm-hmm. What do you mean? <laughs> there's gotta be something. And, you know, that was at the beginning of my journey kind of, of saying, okay, there's gotta be a better way here. This, this can't be. And I think that what we're seeing, and it's funny, we're a lot of these people are defining themselves as biohackers, which is can be a very scary term to people. But I would argue that every one of your patients, every person who refuses to accept the this decline in function and and everything else about us as we age is inherently a biohacker because Absolutely. people who are saying, you know what, I'm going to grab the reins and I'm going to not believe that this has to be and tell me what to do and I'm in. And right. that, that makes you a biohacker right there. <laughs> so what about the last question I'm going to ask you is what about nootropics? Like, do you get into any of those with your patients or do you really, is it more of the pharmaceuticals and the peptides? Like, do you ever have them? I mean, even things like, not that it's necessary. Well, I mean, you know, fish oils or some of these nootropic stacks that are out there right now. We were talking about one earlier, like the quality of mind. Like, do you ever use any nootropics with your patients or do you find that it's kind of a dodgy area. No, I think it's I think it's great. I think there's a lot of them that are really good. I love the Hinocchiol that's out. There's a couple of others that so I love the um L-theanine if you have used L-theanine. I know those don't technically fall in the nootropic category, but I see a whole lot of benefit using that both for patients who are having difficulty with 
concentration and focus yeah. as well as for illness for, uh, you know, the study that just came out about the, with the Polish rowing team about how they were able to um, raise their gamma Delta T cells by using L-theanine. So it's in my coronavirus stack for patients right now. Wow. Anyway, that's, we're talking about nootropics. Um, tell me what your experience with the qualia mind is. I haven't tried it yet. So I've, you know, I've been a, a Qualia Mind customer probably for a few years. I'm not, you know, lately I go through, you know, it's funny. I go through cycles, just sim- similar to your approach. I'm not a big believer in doing all the same things all the time, but especially when I first started using it, I found that it, it just, it narrowed my focus a little mm-hmm. bit. Like, I and mean, we can talk about what we talked about earlier, if you want, actually, like yeah. what oxytocin does for you. Anything that helps me, and like everybody else, like you, I've got too many browser windows open at any given minute, right? I mean, I've got the podcast, I've got the group, I've got my clients, I've got, you know, I've got so many different, I've got my house, you know, I've got my son who's at college, I've got, you've got all these windows open, all these distractions, and, um, and it allows, it somehow allows me to just narrow my focus and get the work done. And it's, it's one of those uh, stacks that seems to work really well for some people. It doesn't work as well for others. For me, I, and I actually, I was, I had my brain mapped and I had it mapped before the, I took my qualia and then he had me open up the capsules and stir them into water, which was vile. I'm, I don't recommend anybody do that, <laughs> but it was just about trying to get it to get into my system faster. We waited about, I want to say 25 minutes or so. And then he remapped my brain and he, the, the, practitioner who was mapping my brain was blown away. He's like, oh my God, like you can see how it's activated different parts of your brain that were not as active before. So what I find about nootropics, and I think that one of the big takeaways for people is depending on where your gaps are, if we want to call them that, different things are going to work for different people. And so I think that, you know, everybody rushes to, oh, I heard this is really great. Or, oh, I heard that's really great. And and the truth is, it's as personalized as anything else. It's really going to depend where your, I don't want to call them deficiencies, but let's just say where the gaps lie in, in, your, in your wall and how a new, different nootropic is going to help you. We use acetyl carnitine a good bit. That's yeah. probably one of my favorites. Um, I use mucuna, purines, and a good, um, get the L-DOPA agonist. Yeah. Um, Although I've, I've heard some caution about Mucuna. No, have you, like, I think Mucuna, as a matter of fact, there was, um, in this, in this Facebook group that I manage, um, there was a guy who came on one day and said, I suggested to a friend of mine that he take Mucuna and he literally became psychotic. Yes. Like he, he experienced psychosis and this poor guy was freaking out saying, you know, I, I don't understand, like, is this even possible? And I think Mikuna is one of those supplements that people need to have a bit of a dose of respect for because it can go the wrong way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think a lot of the others either work or don't. Yeah. And I think that's one and probably Fenibute is one that you have to be aware if you're taking this, that it's not a, it works or it doesn't, it's, it works or it can cause problems. Right. And can it be habit forming also Fenibut? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so again, the cycling, the responsible use, that kind of thing. Right. Phone a friend, get, get an accountability person. If you're going to be taking something like that. Great. And uh, what about the modafinils of the world and all that stuff? Is that something that you play in or do you kind of so I love modafinil for the right patient. The problem is often people get into what I call Elvis syndrome, where they take modafinil in the morning and they take something else at night to help them sleep. And so they're taking something to wake them up in the morning, they're taking something to help them sleep at night. And I think that we're causing more problems than benefits. I think if you're using modafinil on an, a very limited basis, so you have a big presentation that you have to do, or okay. you have a board meeting where you have to be on your game. It's not the solution. It's really more of a, I'm going to say it's a band-aid. It's better than a band-aid. There's so many good benefits for, for modafinil, but I, I caution regular use of modafinil. I'm not sure it's the best choice. And I think all the things we've mentioned have a way better outcome. Um, yeah. Again, well, I think with the peptides, you, what you're doing is you're in some ways you're upgrading the infrastructure, mm-hmm. right? 
Whereas right. with the nootropics, for the most part, I mean, the, the guys that make qualia would say you need less over time. So that implies that it's, it's having some kind of a restorative effect on the brain. But for most of these other nootropics, it's they're, they're not upgrading the infrastructure. They're, they're coming in and doing something for you. So you have right. maybe use them. A I think bit. if you're looking at something like Pinocchio or even there's some recent um, literature on that Meristil, it's being marketed for a, as a hangover drug, but um, dihydromyristil, okay. um, it's got good research um, as infrastructure improvement, as you're suggesting. Um, but I would be cautious. You know, the things that I think are cut, there's this, that new uh, spermidine life that's just come out. I, I'm just testing some spermidine right now. <laughs> yes, it's so exciting. Uh, I think this is super exciting because it is the trash collector in the brain. So this is what upregulates autophagy and autophagy is self-eating. I don't mean self-eating, but I mean, it's, that's taking the trash out. It's saying yeah. all of these things are not things we should be doing. And then it sort of picks through the trash. Like this, we could recycle and use again. Nah, this is too damaged. Let's throw it away. And yes. Yes. And so that's what that spermidine does. It's so exciting to know about it. And I would include that in the category of neurotropics because of that. Interesting. So yeah, no, I've been, I got sent a couple of bottles by, um, by a manufacturer in, in the UK, I think. And so right. I'm on my second week of, and it's also supposed to help with, uh, with hair and skin and nails. Well, autophagy, you know, right. in the brain is one thing, but systemically it's a whole other thing. It's part of the reason why we sometimes put ourselves through the misery of fasting for extended days. Exactly. Now, we didn't talk about things like the rapamycin, which also helps get rid of. So I would include that in my armamentarium for the that. Kind of, senescence. Mm -hmm. So helping, help, help, helping patients to get rid of their senescent cells. Those senescent cells uh, aggravate your stem cells. Your stem cells are your healing reparative cells that are in all of your organs. And so if you're um, not getting rid of those senescent cells, you're just getting rid of the, the senescent cells are getting rid of all of your stem cells. Mm -hmm. And so now, yeah, now you're not able to heal as well as you wanted to. And so things like low dose rapamycin, and we're not talking about the kidney replacement transplant uh, dose, and we're not talking about the cancer dose. This is teeny tiny little doses that are taken intermittently. Again, once a week, twice a week, depending on the disease state, sometimes uh, a little more depending on, you know, the, the disease state. Um, but if we're talking about treating someone preventively in, in a um, cognitive decline prevention program, I would do something um, with my patients a couple times a week, once a week. It just depends on what your provider recommends, but there's so much research. You, you can't, you just put rapamycin into Google search and the cognitive data is, is immense right now. So very exciting to look at that, but it also, it specifically works on decreasing that, um, those senescent cells and up, up regulating the ability of cells to um, go through autophagy and, and help them to clean up, clean themselves up, take a break. It's kind of like lunchtime at my office where you go and you take a break and you eat a sandwich to regenerate. If you, if you just push through and you don't eat that sandwich or take that break, you get to the end of the day and you're completely spent yeah. you have nothing for the next patient. If instead you just take that sort of like what you were mentioning earlier about <clears throat> taking that extra hour to sleep is much more valuable than uh, that extra hour of television. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just take that extra, that hour to give yourself a break to give yourself a, re a recharge with a, a, a snack or a lunch or whatever you're doing, then you actually are able to accomplish more in the, the short amount of time you may have remaining. So it's the same sort of concept uh, with using rapamycin, giving yourself that lunch break to take a breath and uh, re restore. Nice. And with the rapamycin, do you find that, do you counsel your patients to take it on, um, on a day when they might be eating less or fasting or like, would that augment the benefit of, I would think so, right? Cause you're already upregulating the autophagy. Absolutely. So I'll have them do it on a day when they're doing some sort of lighter exercise because it does have some fat burning uh, um, benefits. It does increase uh, the choice of the cell to, to use fat as a substrate mm -hmm. um, as part of that AMPK upregulation. It does increase the number of mitochondria per cell. And um, so- good. Yes. And so I do want them to be active. So they'll need to take some sort of caloric intake. 
Um, but I, I do want them to be active, but it doesn't have to be their heavy weightlifting day. It doesn't have to be their heavy uh, running day. I want them to do some sort of light exercise, um, a zone three, if you're doing that kind of exercise where your heart's, heart rate's up, but you can still have a, a moderate conversation with someone. Nice. Nice. Lovely. Okay. Not on a day when you take any of the growth hormone secretagogues. I'm sorry? Not on a day when you take any of the growth hormone secretagogues. Right. Because then you've got your foot on the gas in the, in the break at the same time. That doesn't right. Okay. Well, I feel like we've covered a lot of ground. Is there anything else you'd like to share with us, Dr. Turner? <laughs> I'm so glad to meet you, Natalie. It's been such a pleasure. Likewise. I mean, this is this has been great. I hope, I mean, we had, we picked this one out of three topics. So I'm really hoping we get to cover the other two in a couple of episodes down the road. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you so much for your time today and for all that you shared. And uh, people, if you're looking to connect with Dr. Turner, why don't you tell us, Dr. Turner, how people can reach out to you? Because I'm sure you're sitting around just, you know, hanging out. <laughs> There are several ways you can reach me um, at my office is vine, as in grapevine, medical.com. My personal website is drs.md. That's drs.md. I'm on YouTube at Suzanne F. Turner, MD. Uh, you can find me on Facebook. I'm a Dr. S. Turner on Instagram. So lots of places to find you. Okay. Well, this was amazing. Thank you so much again. Have a great Thanksgiving next week. I think Thank that's you. your holiday next week. And uh, we'll do this again soon. I look forward to it, Natalie. You take care. You too. Thanks so much for joining me on this episode of the Biohacking Superhuman Performance Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please remember to leave us a five-star review on iTunes because that's what helps us to be heard and to be seen. If you'd like to connect with me directly, or if you'd like to leave any comments, or if you have any questions about this episode, please reach out to me directly through my website, natnidham.com. And of course, if you're not already a member of the Biohacking Superhuman Performance Community on Facebook, that's where you'll find me every day. It's a short application. Just answer a couple of questions and you're in and interfacing with other amazing biohackers. Thanks again. And we'll look forward to seeing you on the next episode.